Good question. Because yeah. 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 it's confidential, but it's yours. You can't go anywhere else. Good evening. This is a meeting of the Scarborough Board of Education, and it is February 15th, 2018. May have the attendance, please. Mrs. Bealey? Here. Mrs. Durgan? Here. Ms. Casalonis? Here. Mrs. Lyford? Here. Ms. Perry? Here. Mr. Shea? Here. Ms. Saar? Here. Mr. Hinton? Here. Mr. Vashon? Here. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are there any adjustments to the agenda? There are none. Moving on to 5.0, public comment on agenda items. If there are any members of the public who wish to make a statement, please come to the podium. Um, before you come up, let me just give you a little bit of outline of how this works. State your na name and address. There is a piece of paper at the podium for you to write that for us. So. Um, you might want to speak first and then write it, or whatever works most comfortable for you. You do have up to three minutes each to speak. Please direct all your comments to the chair. The board will hear but not act on items not on the agenda this evening, but we will receive comments for consideration. Please don't repeat comments that others have already made. And please do not make comments addressing any individual person by name. Please know that we have seen your emails. And as mo many of you know, we have been listening um, in the schools and online. To our board members, I would just say this is time for us to listen. So that's what we will do tonight. Anyone wishing to come to the podium? And if there's others, please go ahead and line up. It'll just save time, so just go right ahead and line up right out the hallway. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is David Cleary. I live at 33 Meeting House Road with my wife Jennifer and our three sons. We've lived in Scarborough nearly 14 years, and our kids have attended Scarborough schools from primary through high school. In short, we've been big supporters of our schools and our kids. I attended the meeting last year when the board voted to approve the school start change and agreed to delay implementation one year to work through the implementation issues. Well, it's nearly a year later, and folks, you have a fractured community on your hands. From high school parents to primary school parents, students, teachers, there are a lot of angry and frustrated people. 
We have emailed, called, attended public meetings, met with board members and administrators, and joined more than 800 others signing a petition, all with the goal of getting this decision reopened. But all we keep hearing is this is a done deal. The decision is final. There's no wiggle room. And I'm wondering why. Why are you so dug in? Why are you holding on to a decision made a year ago that was championed by a former board chair that no longer serves on this board? Why are you not willing to reconsider this decision? The frustration is so high, people are actually having conversations about how can we vote no confidence or maybe recall this board. Those are the kinds of conversations that are happening in your community. The board seems so intent on addressing the adolescent sleep issue at any cost. Have you considered that while a worthy goal, this might just not work for our community, given our geography, busing challenges, and so on. Personally, I don't believe it is the school's job to try to ensure my children get the recommended sleep for optimal performance. That's our job as parents. It is my kids' job to take ownership and personal responsibility for the consequences of their actions. If they're late, up late on social media, staring at their phones, playing Xbox, doing whatever, then they have to deal with their own actions and consequences for their performance. We have parented around this. We are not asking you to implement public health policy. Do you really believe it's in the best interests of five-year-olds to be at bus stops before 7 a.m.? Do you really believe more kids spending two hours a day on a bus is acceptable? Do you really believe families should have to sacrifice family time and be burdened with extraordinarily high aftercare costs? Do you really believe that the solution to athletics scheduling is to simply dismiss students early, thereby cutting into instructional time, educational time? Do you believe it's fair that kids that seek after school employment should be potentially displaced by this policy? My kids love Late Start Wednesday. Do you want to know why? They love it because they get to stay up later on Tuesday night. Do you really believe that by simply changing times, kids will get the recommended sleep? And is that even your responsibility? We ask that you reopen the discussion to seek a more reasonable compromise. If compromise is not possible, then we request that you make no change. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clare. Let me just comment that um, you know we we prefer you refrain from clapping. It just shortens the time that we have to listen to the next person. Good evening. Thank you for. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you for making this possible for us all to speak. I come to you here wearing two hats. One, I'm a Scarborough resident, Lisa Douglas, Three Mayflower Drive in Scarborough. Um, I have two children that have gone through the whole Scarborough school system from K to 12. They are now juniors in college at two very successful colleges and doing very, very well as a result of the decisions that Scarborough's board has made. Um, talking as a parent, um, I want to tell you what I saw. I saw children that were very difficult to get up in the mornings um, during those high school years because it was a different clock that they were on. I saw them um, going to hit Starbucks, different places, to gather unhealthy things to go ahead and get their bodies running, to get ready for learning. Things that concerned me, um, but the need was there. Because on the other end, they were both working very hard to go ahead and do their academics, stayed up late to meet above and beyond requirements, and to do the workload that was there. So it ended up being um, a challenge in the morning, one that now, as I see things, especially as a teacher as well, and pair the two of them together and see their college outcome, I see that could have been done better. Um, I'm very much in favor of us doing an early start for the little ones. I happen to teach kindergarten here in, in our school system and have done so for over 15 years. 
And I can tell you that as I'm coming into work at 7 a.m., um, the children that are racing in to before care after me are almost plowing me over. They are very much awake. They are very much going. And I can tell you from myself as a parent, my kiddos got up at the latest at 6 a.m. So I see an earlier biological clock in my experience and what goes on. Um, putting my teacher hat on now, um, my children are very much ready to learn whenever I'm ready to start. I see them actively engaged in some academic things as well as play things when I walk through the before care area. Um, but what I also see is come 2, 2.15 in my academic day, I see the stamina gone. I have kids flopping over, um, doing all kinds of things. So obviously their optimum, what I'm trying to say is their optimum time is from the start of the school day at 9 o'clock until approximately 1 o'clock. Um, looking at that window, as I now crunch that time frame, and I've got my specials in that block, I've got um, two um, movement releases two recesses as a kindergarten teacher, one recess at grades one to two. I've got a lot of things coming out of that morning optimum time. To be able to grab more morning optimum time would be ideal for the students I'm teaching. Um, there's no question about it, hands down. And then I can put movement things and bring back some crafts into my classroom, things that I can't do now because I'm driving curriculum in a tight time frame. And in the afternoon, they're just too tired to, for me to bring out a bunch <coughs> of stuff. It would not be pretty in my classroom. So I just want to thank you for your efforts in doing this. Um, and I want to end by saying, of all the years I've been here, I've watched the effort, the time, the blood, the sweat, the tears that you folks put in as a board. You take the hits. You walk around with bullseyes on your back, um, doing the best you can for Scarborough kids and I trust you. Yes, we may not have some details worked out right now, but I know that you get up every morning with our kids on your hearts and saying, what can we do best? So on behalf of myself, I thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Janine Pendergast, and I live on 2 Phineas Lane. Um, I wanted to come here tonight to speak to the with speak to the concerns in the community with regard to the start time change in the fall. Um, I, like others, probably sent an email with a detailed letter to all of you. Um, in my letter, I talked about some obstacles that I believe that the start time creates and asked you um, to help please provide some clarity to the community and to school administrators on how the obstacles will be mitigated. Um, in an ideal world, I think that we would have identified many of these or many or all of these obstacles, explored our options, and arrived at the best solutions prior to even voting on this. However, we all know that it's not an ideal world. So I would ask all of you one question. Are we trying to force a square peg into a round hole with this decision? If so, the are the potential benefits from maybe the older the kids getting more sleep worth it? Without the tra transparency on how these obstacles are being resolved, uh, it's hard for us as parents to have confidence that it's worth making this change. I joined the Parent Implementation Committee to help be a part of that transparency and tr try to help with that communication and I feel as a committee we're not getting the transparency and we don't feel confident and comfortable that we have all the information that we need to feel confident that these obstacles are actually going to be successfully addressed. Um, the discord that it, this has created is extremely counterproductive to the success of our students and our schools. In my short two and a half years here in Maine in Scarborough um, I've quickly learned that Scarborough has a very passionate, active, involved parent group. And I think we just want the confidence that these obstacles are being addressed and successfully mitigated without being detrimental to the instructional time the students will be receiving. A major reason for <coughs> families moving to Scarborough and living in Scarborough, I know because I just did it two and a half years ago, is for the quality of the school system. The teachers and the building administrators are a huge part of that. 
and there's a lot of people in this room and I see a lot of teachers and a lot of school administrators and that makes me more nervous probably than it does that there's a lot of parents in this room. Um, if we can't keep and recruit top-notch teachers, it's, we're not going to be able to maintain the quality of the education system. And no matter what the start time is, I think that everyone's opinion is that it's very important to maintain high quality education system. And so I guess I would just ask you to please consider helping us have the confidence that these obstacles will be mitigated without cutting into instructional time or um, creating um, issues for vocational students to possibly get themselves to their locations or have longer days um, and you know even to to know if there's enough room for before and after care that's needed with this time change thank you thank you Hi, I'm Diana Nelson. Um, I live at Five Woodwood Street in Scarborough. Um, many people have said a lot of the things that I was going to say, so I won't art waste anybody's time re-articulating some of those things. They were really eloquently put. Um, but I want you to see me. I'm a mom in Scarborough. I moved here specifically for the schools, for what this town had to offer in the way of natural resources. And obviously, we want a great environment for our kids to thrive in. And our experience with the school system to date, I can't say enough good things. I mean, blew me away, surpassed expectations in every regard. And so it's been such a stark contrast for me to see how this issue of implementation has been unveiled and unrolled. It's been not what you get in the school district from transparency and open arms and open communication. This felt really like there's a proverbial line in the sand and you're on that side and we're on this side. We're not willing to listen and we're not willing to compromise. And so I don't know if that's true. If we're not willing to listen, it's felt like that. I felt pretty disregarded and <coughs> disrespected to a degree. Um, I do want to say that I respect all opinions. This board, I believe, has the best intentions. Um, but I just never thought I'd be standing here in front of you questioning leadership because it's not comfortable for me. I don't think it's uncomfortable or comfortable for anyone. Um, but I just believe we've chosen the wrong plan in Scarborough. I really do. And I know we're pretty far down the road here, but I don't feel like it's ever too late to turn back when you feel like you've reached some insurmountable problems. And for many, I feel like some of the problems are insurmountable. And there's no way to get used to thinking of my kid on a bus for two hours a day. I don't think that's fair. I don't think it's a fair ask of any kid. And if it's happening now, we should focus on how to make that not happen. Uh, we're going to bear an additional cost for childcare which you know we were pretty happy to get rid of one of the daycare bills and now we're getting that cost placed back on us i'm a small business owner we provide benefits for our employees we're working to buy a location to grow our business and grow jobs in this community and now i need to divert some of those resources to something that i don't feel like we should be burdening parents with I, we can find the money but will others be able to so those are, and, and you know, and every kid is different. My kids happen to not wake up until 7.30. So we will be adjusting sleep cycles in my house in the opposite direction. So I, again, respect everyone's opinion and their point of view, but I just feel like this plan that we're moving forward with is so extreme. And I, I support your choice to move start times back for adolescents if they need it, but this doesn't feel like the right plan. I think if we were to compromise, you know, perhaps doing something more in line with the neighboring districts, starting high school at 8 o'clock, which was one of the plans that I believe was on the table that didn't cause so many avoidable problems, would be something that I would wholeheartedly support and be willing to rally behind the board to help move this forward. I'm really concerned with the dividedness within our town, very, very concerned. And 
again, I respect each one of you, your opinions, the time that you've dedicated to this issue, but I just really would ask that you would reconsider and reopen this discussion formally. Thank, Thank you. you. Anyone else who wishes to approach the podium, please do so. Just go right ahead and go up. I mean, you know, you're all here tonight. If you want to say something, please do that. So just line right up so we can save time. Hi, I'm Sonia Serafin, 5 Ryefield Drive. Thank you for opening this up for us to speak tonight. I appreciate it, as I know others do. Um, from a personal level, I just would like to say I love the current time for my son, who's a first grader. He's seven years old at Blue Point. He happens to sleep until 7.30. He tends to sleep closer to 12 hours, which is within that 10 to 12 hours recommended sleep for his age. He plays hard, he works hard, he's a joy to be around, but not if he doesn't get enough sleep. <laughs> Next year, if the changes go into effect, we'll have to give up some of the joys of his extracurricular activities, which, depending on the time of year, is soccer, basketball, baseball, Lego robotics, coding robotics, and faith formation. We don't want to give up any of those things. It's part of who he is. We feel it's going to make him a better student and a better person in the long run. But in order for him to meet his sleep cycle, we'll have to give that up so he can get enough sleep and be out at the bus by 7.15, because currently he's sleeping at 7.15. I contacted um, the Start School Later folks. They're the big organization, as I'm sure you're aware, out of the DC area that are big grassroots efforts for this. I asked them what their recommended sleep is for kids ages 4 to 11 <coughs> and how they feel that this can be rolled out without impacting them. And they said there are limited and inconsistent studies for that age group, so we're not making any recommendations. But we realize communities meet, have different challenges, so they may make a choice to impact the youngest ones, but we wouldn't necessarily recommend that they do that. So I thought that was interesting because there's so much concern for the high school kids, but in my opinion, it's being done to the detriment of the younger kids, and my child is one that will be affected. So I ask that this plan be revisited. I can't say whether or not a high school student's gonna go to bed later or earlier. I think there's other factors like social media, Facebook. I just started Facebook a year ago. I'm addicted to it, <laughs> unfortunately. I wish I never started. My friend said, we want to see pictures of Joshua and the dog, and I said, okay, I'll join, and now I'm on it. So, and I know high school kids studies show that they tend to have more addiction tendencies to social media, and um, so I think that's one of the biggest culprits of why they're up late. So I would just ask, if you do revisit this, which I hope you do, you'll do it in a way that is less impactful to the youngest kids so they can still have after school activities, they can still get their recommended hours of sleep, but maybe you can bump it up a little bit for the high school, just kind of find that balance for everyone so there'll be less obstacles and challenges. Thank you for your time, thank you for listening. Thank you. Do I need a sign in? I'm sorry, I came in late. <laughs> yes, the, there is a sign in sheet. Right, yeah, uh, yeah, I don't want to set the time. Right. Hello, I'm uh, Doug Bennett. I live at 32 Tall Pines Road here in Scarborough. I'm also a te teacher at the middle school for the last 25 years or so. And I guess I have an essential question with, to me is, why do we need to be so Scarborough and have such a radical and drastic change to our school start times? When it seems to me that a simple 30 to 45 minute change uh, would do the trick to make everybody happy. Looking around our town, I think uh, we need to find a solution to what, what is happening right now and this drastic of a change is not going to do it. <clears throat> I know that one single issue isn't going to sway you to reconsider your decision, but after the I can't see, sorry. After hearing so many serious and real concerns that we all have, I don't know how you can't reconsider, think about reconsidering this issue. At the middle of school, the morning isn't the issue. Year in and year out, my, most, my best behaved, most focused and highest achieving classes meet in the morning. When we discuss students' issues, the words, they are having a hard time this, uh, this morning because they are tired, have never ever been spoken. 
And with all due respect, when I watch the Channel 8 News, I hear that students came to our school feeling jet lagged. I'm absolutely stunned, confused, and wonder where that information was made up. As a person who deals with our students every day, I can assure you it wasn't from Scarborough Middle School. I don't know what happens in California, Ohio, or Minnesota, but I do know what happens to the students in Scarborough, Maine, and they are, they are tired in the afternoon. Being in class until almost 3.30 will not be in the best interest of our students. As a high school soccer coach here in Scarborough, I'm also concerned how this impacts our student athletes. Creative scheduling isn't going to change as time the sun sets. We already have to use the lights to practice uh, in the fall. How much money will be thrown away doing this more often? Every Monday as a teacher in the middle school, I will have meetings until 5.15. So the girls soccer team won't be able to practice until at least 5.30 to 7 at the earliest, a time that is often dark for a big part of the season. On that Monday, if a field hockey team, boys soccer, or first team football have a game on the turf that night, uh, perhaps we might have practice from 8.30 to 10 <coughs> outdoors in October and November. <clears throat> How is that in the best interest of our students? I'm sure that this, this fall, some schools will be willing to have its athletes, coaches, parents, and game personnel stay 60 or 90 minutes later than they usually do just to host Scarborough. Do we have that same guarantees going forward from a school that hosts Scarborough several times a year? from multiple sports. This year my team had to catch a number of buses from the high school at 2.15 or 2.30. How much academic time will my students lose, my, my athletes lose? Who's covering my classes while I'm gone? What about the high school and middle school athletes who play three or four sports and have about six away games per season? They were losing days, if not weeks, of that instructional time each year. How is that in the best interest of our students? Simply put, the school department has destroyed and divided my beloved hometown like the budget issue never could. It really breaks my heart because I love Scarborough so much. Ironically, this issue was created by the schools and done by choice. So it's up to the board and the schools to fix this. I feel like you must revote on this issue, and you must do it soon, so we can end this issue once and for all. I understand the fire still is a cause for all of you, but no one in the world thinks this issue can't be changed right up until the moment when my kids get on the bus in the fall. No matter the results of your, of your next vote, if you revote, this will end the destruction that has been done to our community and everyone can move on to bigger and better things. If not, you need to find a way to end this soon. And simply saying, this is going to happen, or telling parents they are wrong, isn't going to do it. As we hear shortly from our union rep, the teachers are the ones who know the, stu the students of Scarborough the best are adamantly against this. Please listen to us. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I'm Jillian Trapini Hop. I have four children here in Scarborough. Uh, I, I live in, on 315 Beach Ridge Road. Um, I, I've heard some people say that children get up earlier. That's not my experience. I'm ripping my child out of bed. He's going to be a third grader next year. I'm ripping him out of bed now at 8 o'clock. Um, he also needs closer to the 12 hours of sleep. And, um, <laughs> you know, that's because he's moving nonstop. I mean, <coughs> having to put him to bed starting at 6, 6.30 at night uh, is, is not ideal at all for our family um, or for him. He likes to also participate in a lot of after school activities, a lot of which don't start now until 5.30 to meet parents' scheduling. So it, it, it seems like we're going to have to give a lot of that up. Um, also, my son, doesn't do well on the bus as it is. And I think starting at 7 a.m., which I've heard for our bus stop will be 7 a.m. and riding until 8, I can't imagine that get any, getting any better. Um, and then having to get to school and perform. Um, that's a huge concern to me. We have looked at how we can rearrange our schedule so he doesn't have to be on the bus. But I, I, don't, I don't think that that is, you know, I don't think that's ideal either anyway. Um, I've also heard a lot that you have only received 32 emails over the past several months from parents, and I find that hard to believe. Not that I am saying that you're, you're lying. I, I, I don't want you to think that, but um, I think maybe I have written 32 <laughs> emails. So um, 
I, I don't know. I don't know where those are going if they're being directed to spam. But I really do wish somebody would look into that because I know personally there's a room full of people who have been sending emails. Um, and anyway, I just would hope that you would really reconsider this because, as everybody has said, this has been a very um, a dividing topic in this town and uh, a lot of people are really angry and I know that you do really work hard. Um, we hope that you can meet somewhere halfway. Thank you. Thank you. Just come right in. The people that are in the hallway, if you could just come right into the room. <laughs> just come right into the room if you're standing in the hallway. Please just line right up closely so we can move past. Hi, my name is Corey. I'm um I uh, live here in Scarborough and once here Liberty Lane. I, I'm fortunate that I have two um, young boys. One's eight and the other one is 14, so I guess he's not quite as young as he used to be. Um, so this scene plays out in my house every day. Um, and I have to wake up my 14-year-old at uh, 6.10 to be on the bus. And uh, there aren't a lot of things in my life that I can say with 100% confidence that uh, are, are wrong, but that's definitely wrong. Having to wake my 14-year-old up at 6.10 to get on the bus, is it's miserable for him, it's miserable for us, uh, and it's just, it doesn't fit. And um, when I'm not chasing my kids all over the state, I also happen to be the director of one of the largest sleep labs um, in the state. Uh, we do between 80 and 100 sleep studies a month. Half of those sleep studies are on kids um, who are struggling um, with all kinds of different sleep issues. and. I'm not, you know, blaming high school start times for all those, you know, issues that are out there, but I can see it. I talk to folks, I talk to families, I talk to patients who um, their lives are changed by some of the therapies that we do to help them get, you know, more sleep. And you want to check the science. It's not about how much time um, they sleep. It's when they sleep. That's what's important. 14-year-old, um, you know, young, young adults, <coughs> young high schoolers, they need to get sleep in the early morning stages of their sleep cycle for it to really make a difference. So um, they may stay up later. You know, it's not, you know, this isn't going to miraculously make them all go to bed at 8 o'clock, you know, at night. But uh, as long as they're getting that sleep in the early morning hours um, when they really, truly need it, that's what will make the difference. And you look at the pressure that our young adults are under today, you know, now in the community. I don't know if a lot of you know we had a a suicide of a middle schooler out in Yarmouth just a few weeks ago. Um, there's obviously what happened you know, down in Florida recently. Our kids are under so much pressure. Anything that we can do to help our young adults get more sleep at the right times, we need to do it. We need to do it. We'll figure the rest out, okay? Practices. My kids are all involved in sports. I have three of them. I just ran from a pool in Westbrook to a soccer practice in Saco to drop somebody off homes that I could be here tonight for this hearing. And that's not going to get any better, you know, if the times are changed and adjusted, but I'm willing to take that on so that my 14-year-old, who is banking on this change, when he talks, he's going to be in high school next year, and when he talks about it, he says to me, Dad, I can't wait for the times to change so that I can get a little bit more sleep in the morning. So um, he's banking on it. So I applaud the work that the school board has done. I wholeheartedly support um, the decision to change starts times. Um, I think you've done the right thing um, for Scarborough based on all the um, challenges that we have. And uh, I don't think it's up to you to solve, you know, to fix the problems that I'm going to have to, or the adjustments that I'm going to have to make with my kids, um, you know, to make it go. Um, but I really um, hope that you continue forward um, with this change uh, and you make it happen. And my eight-year-old, you know, I sometimes have to wake him up. And the difference is he says, good morning, Daddy. <laughs> when I wake up, my 14-year-old is just, uh, that's that's all I get out of him. So, uh, and it doesn't matter. It can be six o'clock, it can be since ten. I have no you know concerns about getting him up early, and I understand too the concerns about um, having to pay for aftercare. We were excited to not have to pay. This would be the first year where we weren't going to have to pay for aftercare because you know our oldest would be home first to get the youngest off the bus. But we will take that on. You know, we'll adjust. And my wife's excited about getting to work a little bit earlier, you know, not having to wait, you know, until 9 o'clock to put our youngest on the bus. Um, so we'll, we'll figure that out, too. So, um, yes, thank you for your work on this, and I hope you continue to move forward with the changes. Uh, and there are other families out there that feel the same way. Sometimes we're kind of the silent majority. Not everybody's comfortable coming up to a mic, um, but it's, it's the right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good evening. Uh, I'm Kimberly Cornwall, uh, 21 Hidden Creek Drive here in Scarborough. And I have two high school children. Uh, both of them play sports uh, all three seasons. Um, and the change, it's much easier to wake up a high school student than it is to have a high school student miss classes uh, at the end of school to go to a sports activity and then try to make up the worst the work that they've missed. Um, they are in cross country. Uh, cross country you run through the woods. Uh, later release means later start to their activities and there's no lights out there. Um, I ask you to please revisit the April 27th meeting where you had four high school students come up to the mic and speak against the time change and tell you their feelings. You know, originally I thought, oh, this is going to be great. This is what the kids want. It's not. Uh, your kids that have athletic activities after school, um, it's not going to help them. It's going to harm them. Um, <coughs> you may think that athletics aren't a big deal. Well, when you're in high school, maybe that athletic activity is your college scholarship. And maybe that's their way of getting part of college paid for them. So it is important. And, um, you know, I know a lot of people have the concern for the elementary. Well, the high school have a big concern as well. And I just ask you to please look at what these people said on April 27th. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else who wishes to speak? This is your opportunity, you know, you're here this evening, we're here to listen to you. Please come forward if you have anything you want to say at this time. <coughs> Seeing none, we will move on. Six point oh is new business. And we have 6.1, the second reading of the 2018-2019 school calendar. Is there a motion? Move approval is printed. Second. Second. Any questions? We've looked at this already, and I don't, none of you have contacted me, so I'm wondering if you have. Okay. All in favor of approval of the school calendar for 2018-19, second reading. Seven plus two. Thank you. Seven point oh um, is on the school side. We have a report. Yes, I'd like to invite the um, Scarborough Education Association president, Justin Stebbins, to the podium. He has a letter that he would like to read to the school board. Good evening. My name is Justin Stebbins. Um, I've been a teacher for 13 years in Scarborough. I te I've taught at the high school, the Wentworth, for many years, and uh, currently I am at the middle school teaching French and Spanish. Um, I come to you today in my capacity as the president to speak on behalf of the majority of the teachers um, in the association. So I have provided for you a letter um, that succinctly states our position, and I would like to read it to you today. On January 23rd, the Representatives Assembly of the Scarborough Education Association, our governing body, held a membership meeting of those working under either the professional contract or the educational support professional contract. This meeting was pulled together at the request of the Representative Assembly due to rising animus in our membership around the start school start time issue. There were 106 members present in total. The breakdown by phase level was relatively consistent with the percentages of the membership at each phase. At this meeting, members were given the opportunity to speak on their views around the change in school start times. A few themes presented themselves which I would like to share with you. Members continue to be dubious about the veracity of the research and its connection specifically, to how current Scarborough students are affected in a more than just theoretical manner. Members are disheartened by the seemingly dismissive manner in which the original survey data was collected and then analyzed. 
and members are anxious about the impact of another partially realized plan that will create hardships for many involved. After public comments on this issue, members were asked to cast a vote on whether they supported this change for Scarborough Public Schools at this time. Overwhelmingly, members were not in support of this change. Therefore the, association, therefore, the association believes that it is not the right time to implement this dramatic a shift in school start times. Further, the membership of the association requests that the school board give serious consideration to their voice and delay the implementation until such a time that there is a definitive Scarborough connection to the research and a thorough, thoughtful plan that has been vetted by a representative amount of staff before it goes into action. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Justin. Um, so typically, <laughs> so typically what we do when we have the school system present to us is you have an opportunity to ask a question. Again, I will remind you that, you know, we're listening this evening. So, you know, I, I hope that you'll take that into consideration because it is time for us to listen to all sides. So are there any questions from any board members of Justin? Justin, if you want to come back up for a second. I just had a detailed question. Yes. Um, how many members are in your, the, the SEA that you represent, Justin? So uh, in these, under these two contracts, there's roughly 256 members. Okay. And um, so 106 members made it um, according to our bylaws. Um, to do a meeting like this and to have a vote, we need a quarter, and we had well over a quarter of, to make quorum. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a question for Mrs. Sizemore. What is the longest bus ride for an elementary child at the present time? About 35 to 40 minutes. Thank you. Any other questions? Very good. Thank you, Justin. Thank you. Now we'll step into the work workshop portion of our meeting. Um, I hope that um, people who are here uh, would uh, we'd love to have you stay. We're just going to move over to this table so that we can talk to each other a little bit better during the workshop portion. But I think that a lot of the information is very valuable this evening. So if you can stay, please do so. And I would invite the leadership team members who are here to join us at the table um, for the workshop session as well. So this item here is on the main integrated youth health survey analysis. All right, so this presentation will really answer some of those questions about what is the connection to our students and the data around um, the various health issues that our young people face. So thank you to those of you who are able to stay. Um, to get us started before I introduce our presenters, I like to remind you of our mission. Um, this is something that we like to remind ourselves of often when we are um, at school board workshops and in other forms, um, really studying the work that we do as a school system. So our mission here in Scarborough um, sounds like this. The fundamental purpose of the Scarborough Public Schools is to provide a safe and inclusive learning environment where each and every student is empowered to be a resilient, lifelong learner who is prepared to engage as a contributing member of society. And when we think about um, our core values and what are those collective commitments that we all um, are committed to to ensure that that mission becomes a reality, we think about this. We believe that decisions in planning, instruction, and continuous improvement of our schools must be made with students' individual needs and interests as our primary consideration. And when we share this belief statement, we then outline all of our collective commitments, and that's in the, the full document. This is just the intro statement. 
So now that we know why we exist and we've reminded ourselves of our core values that guide our work, we think about the type of school district that we're trying to become. And this is our long range vision for continuous improvement. The Scarborough Public Schools will be a high quality, forward looking public school district known for its whole, whole child approach that together with dynamic academic programs, enriching co-curricular experiences, and a vibrant learning community that challenges, excites their imagination, and instills excellence in thought and action while preparing them for highly engaged and fulfilling lives while they're in school and beyond. So in our long range vision for um, continuous improvement, we have four strategic themes. Our first strategic theme is effective teaching and learning. The second strategic theme is safe and inclusive schools. Our third is global citizenship. And our fourth is community engagement. Our next episode of Scarborough Inside Public Schools highlights our Wentworth students and the work that they're doing um, to accomplish and realize global citizenship. And we think about these things as being really interconnected. It's hard to isolate one of these strategic themes and the various strategic actions that um, nest underneath these big, broad goals without really thinking about another. Um, and so today, we're going to hone in on strategic theme two, which is safe and inclusive schools. Um, Molly and Mary are going to um, guide us through unpacking the data of our main integrated youth health survey data that we give to our students every two years. Molly Montgomery works at the high school and she supports our students in a variety of ways. We're excited to have her point eight of the time this year. We um, really only had her part time in years past and it has allowed us to really engage in some prevention work and some strategic planning and so we're really excited um, to have Molly hear more. And Mary Record is our high school health teacher. Um, she has been in the district for a number of years and is an awesome student advocate. So with that I hand it over to them so they can walk us through the data. Thank you, Julie. Thanks for having us here tonight. I'm start by mentioning that the main integrated youth health survey data is being presented to you by Mary and myself for the high school only, not the middle school. Um, that will be done by Denise. Okay. Oops. By Diane. To Denise. D Mary Thank you. Just a little background on the, of the Maine Integrated Youth Health Survey. Remember that it is given every two years. We started giving this survey in February of 2009. And the questions are from a collection of national health surveys that Mary is going to speak to a little bit. So the National Health Data Surveys is where, we, where the questions come from the, main, from the main Integrated Youth Health Surveys, like the National Institute of Health, the Monitoring the Future Survey, which most of you are familiar with, the Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance, and the National Youth Tobacco Survey, which are um, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention Surveys. So the questions have been tested for reliability and validity as well as the answers. Um, and with the help of the Opportunity Alliance in our community, they helped us pull the be, we're able to correlate a lot of these uh, data numbers for us tonight. The types of questions asked include questions about substance use, including alcohol, tobacco, marijuana, and other drugs, bullying, sexual health, injury, physical activity and nutrition, mental health, protective factors, and school climate. In 2017, <coughs> there were a couple of different questions added. There was a question that gave information about what's called ACEs. ACEs stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. I'll talk a little bit more about the ACEs question 
further in the presentation. I'm just giving you a heads up that these are two new things in the 2017 survey. The second thing that was added was a question, or actually it was three questions, about vaping. Now, we noted on here that these two things, we have data, not for Scarborough High School specifically, but it is county level data. The reason for this has to do with the way they give the survey. There are four versions of the Maine Integrated Youth Health Survey. Each high school gets two of those versions. In 2017, Scarborough High School did not get the version of the survey that included these two questions. Therefore, the data we have comes from the other schools in Cumberland County who got those surveys that included these questions. So before we show the details of the data, we just wanted to clarify about confidence intervals. So the percentages shown are an estimate, and most people are familiar with confidence intervals, but just for a review, so you know, we have a really clear slide on the next slide too. So a confidence interval is really similar to a margin of error that you see often with political polls. So you may see you know, 50% with a margin of error of 5%. A confidence interval is a little bit more specific and it shows a range where you have like the lower confidence interval limit and the upper confidence limit. So for a really good example is here, for the question, do you agree or disagree in your community that you feel like you matter to people? In 2015, the average response rate was 51.3%, but the confidence interval was between 50 and 52.5%. For 2017, the same question resulted in 57.3% average, but the confidence interval was 55.9, 58.6. Because the confidence interval ranges do not overlap, that's when we can call something statistically significant. So we really have to look not just at those numbers and say, wow, that was a 6% difference. It's all within the confidence interval. That's where we can talk about statistically significant differences. Oh, this is me too, sorry. Oh, no, this is you. I'm on the wrong one. So the, the survey gives us general trends um, on our current students. As a reminder, the survey is given every two years. Therefore, every two years, half the population has changed. There's a different cohort of students. And every four years, the data represents a completely new cohort of students because the entire population has changed over four years. So it's just a reminder that this is not longitudinal data. Um, it doesn't represent changes in individual students over time. So as with the SAT data, it, it gives us a sense of, of what students are reporting and helps us to see, in a general way, trends in our school. Um, also, we just wanted to point out really quickly that we've had a noticeable number of decline in student participation in the Maine Integrated Youth Health Survey since 2009. So in 2009, we had 920 students, and the number has declined, whereas 2017, we had only 697 students out of our 1,000 student population. Uh, decline. So that's a, just something to point out that as our numbers decline, you know, you sometimes see a decline in the number of behaviors reported as well. So that's just something we wanted you guys to keep in mind. So now we're going to take a look at some of the data points. So this first slide shows the 30 day cigarette use at the high school. The numbers represented, represent percentages, and it is st statistically significant. I might have to practice that a few more times, huh? <laughs> the the uh, percentages between 2011 and 2017 are statistically significant on this one. I was going to do this one too, right? Yep. Here we go with um, alcohol use at the high school. Two questions. Um, the upper graph you see there in gray represents the question, how many days did you have at least one drink of alcohol? The percentage that answered at least one a day. And then the lower graph represents percentages on 30-day use, past 30-day use. 
Again, we see a statistically significant difference in 2011 and 2017 on the lifetime use only. So it's just notable that the, the, the numbers, when you just look at the percentages, you know, at a glance, um, it often appears that there's, there's more, more drop than there might be or more increase than there might be because we, we have to look at what's statistically significant. Right. So we look at marijuana use, we see a similar trend. The lifetime use uh, wasn't asked in 2013, so there's that gap there. But we see a statistically significant decline in 2013 versus 2017. Uh, during your life, how many times have you ever used marijuana as on top, and the last 30 days is the number on bottom. Um, so there is that drop there, uh, which is interesting to note there was also a drop in participation of students answering the survey as well. So it's just interesting. We don't know why these numbers have dropped. We just know that they have. <coughs> and then with, we see a similar thing with prescription drug use, 30 days. It is low and it tends to remain low, and it's, but it's statistically equal. So from 2009 to 2017, 30-day prescription drug use of a prescription that was not prescribed to them. <coughs> There are three questions that relate to depression. This is one of them. The question asks, have you felt sad or hopeless almost every day for two weeks during the past year? And we see that it is hovering right around 20% uh, with no significant difference from 2009 to 2017. Uh, in the suicidality question, so feelings of suicide has stayed also level at around 11% in the last eight years or so. And the question reads, during the last 12 months, did you ever seriously consider attempting suicide? Um, so that number has stayed steady as well following the feelings of depression scale. But Molly has good news for this one. So with this one, the question asks, during the time that you were feeling sad or hopeless, did you seek out help from an adult? Um, I'm happy to say that we do see a sig significant difference between 2013 and 2017. Um, a lot more students are seeking out help from an, an adult, and I think that's something that, that we can be proud of. Um, so now we're going to compare Scarborough use, substance use with state use, and statistically we are equal to what's happening in the state of Maine when it comes to 30-day alcohol use, 30-day marijuana use, and 30-day prescription drug misuse. Uh, even though especially it looks like the marijuana question is significantly different, it is not. Uh, we are on par with the state in terms of those three indices. Um, we do have, though, statistically significant lower tobacco use rate in the last 30 days than other main high schools. So that is good news. Molly, I'm going to talk to you about the vaping question. So remember, this, these three questions about vaping are the ones that were on the 2017 survey only. So we. The first question asked about lifetime use. Have you ever used an electronic vapor product? The second question is past 30 day use. And the third question asked what was in the product. Nicotine was usually in the, is what they endorsed. So all of these indicators are statistically equal to the state average. So in other words, What's happening in Cumberland County is happening in, in other, place, other counties in the state of Maine. We are, we are no different. This is the question about adverse childhood experiences. So they, they used six things that they asked about. <coughs> Have any of these six things ever happened to you? Parents divorced or separated, 
parent died, the parent was in jail or prison, lived with an adult with a mental illness, your parent uh, physically or emotionally abused. And what we see here is that nearly one in four Maine high school students have experienced three or more <coughs> adverse childhood experiences. The majority have experienced less than three, and over one-third have experienced no adverse events. What interesting is when we looked at the data of correlating students who have experienced three or more adverse childhood experiences with the substance use questions, we saw students who had three or more adverse childhood experiences were three times more likely to have smoked cigarettes in the last 30 days, twice as likely to have used alcohol in the last 30 days, and twice as likely to have smoked marijuana in the last 30 days. Another interesting correlation here is uh, when we looked at protective factors, and the one that really stuck, stood out was when you looked at students who said, our, our low number of students who used alcohol on school property in the last 30 days, it was 1.6%. And the two factors that were associated with that, 91.6% of our students said our family has clear rules about drug and alcohol use, and 83.6 said parents regularly engage with, engage with them regarding what's going on in their school day. So, you know, kind of common sense right there, but, you know, family rules and parent engagement really seem to strike that factor uh, regarding alcohol use. So here's some risk factors regarding alcohol. These are things that our students are telling us. They're telling us that it is easy for them to have access to alcohol. They're also telling us that they don't think that they, yeah, they don't think they would be caught drinking by their parents. And they don't believe that it is wrong to have, for someone to have one or two drinks a day. All of these represent some statistically significant difference from the state average. The Scarborough High School is in gray, as a reminder, and Maine uh, is in, in red, or burgundy. Yeah. It's similar, too, when it comes to marijuana. Um, ease of access and friends view that marijuana is not harmful is are, are keeping that rate at the level that it is. Um, and these are pretty on par with state averages. Again, Scarborough's in gray and the state is in maroon. Some other factors that we would want to look at and consider. There's a question that asks, do you believe at least one teacher cares and gives support to you when needed? Fortunately, we have 80% of our students who endorse that. 62% of our students feel like they matter in this community. And 95% of our students feel safe at school. The other indicator, whoops, got one more in there. Um, the question asks, do you believe adults in school address conflict in a positive way to help students? And this is at 28.2%. Interestingly, this is about consistent with other schools in the state of Maine. This is, we're not that different. Um, we believe that part of what this speaks to is our ongoing need to engage students in uh, working with us when we look at various policies like discipline. All right. So finally, uh, to, to wrap up, we created this to highlight some of the things that we're doing at the high school that, that we believe are 
helpful. I'm grateful to be part of our great team of student and student support services. We have guidance counselors, social workers, college placement personnel, and nurses. We also have our second year in our advisory program, which tries to connect students with at least one caring adult for the four years of their high school experience. And that's something we have every day at the high school. We are constantly working to build student leadership through student-led and student-initiated programs. Um, the ones I have listed here are only a few of the things that, of the programs are the program, uh, the <laughs> activities we have at school, including Natural Helpers Yellow Tulip Project, which is uh, to highlight mental illness, response to sexual violence prevention, National Honor Society, civil rights, and others. Um, being one of our two health teachers at the high school, uh, we have a one semester in four years comprehensive curriculum, including a special emphasis on mental health, suicide prevention and intervention, um, drug and alcohol prevention intervention, um, among other topics that are relevant for our students. And finally, we have professional development for our staff that includes suicide intervention, drug awareness, mental health challenges, and gender identity education. Again, whenever possible, students um, are a part of the professional development um, and share, sometimes it's sharing their, their own uh, stories and, and sometimes it's working with us to, um, to create a, a program. Um, but we try to involve our students a bit. Uh, with the issues that they feel passionate about. I think that's, that, um, that's what we have for you, you tonight. Question? No. No. It was taken yeah, off there. That, that was more for... It's more for you. Um, Mary and I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. So we're in a workshop mode now, so we'll just, <coughs> um, I just had a question on why do we think that less students are taking the survey? survey. Yeah. That's a great question. We don't we don't know exactly why they are. We just we do know that they are. Anecdotally we know I think it was the twenty seventeen survey um, where there was a couple students who realized that they could opt out and they chose to do so and it became very vocal and so sometimes you had entire advisories of students saying I'm not taking this um, that's yeah that's one um, that's one thing that we as she said anecdotally we can say that that happened in, in 2017 a couple of other things factors that might impact that have to do with um, students that are absent on the day that we give the survey um, are asked to come to take the survey on a, on a different day that I, I set up for them because I have to be on the coordinates that, and they may not show up, or they may, you know, they just may choose not to, not to come and take do the retake on retake day. So that's another reason. Um, I know that uh, there has been certainly with the with the the Vogue students coming back at a different time of the day than the time that's designated for the taking the survey has had an impact on their willingness to take it because just because of their different schedule and the things that they're wanting to do when they get back to, to school. Um, so those are those are a few things that that I think we can we can point to. I guess my concern is the folks who aren't taking it are right. choosing not to take it. Those are the kids yep. that I I'm worried about. We share that same concern. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. All right, sorry. That kind of relates to my question because I was wondering if there's 300 less students taking the survey, how does that affect the statistical significance? Right. That's a great question. I wish I, I had a good answer for that. Um, it certainly has the potential to drive numbers in different directions depending on the population of students who are choosing to take it. And right, like, you know, the students have learned more and more over the years, like, this is an optional survey. We can't 
make them take it the way, you know, and it's not as high stakes as like SAT or something. Like this is a survey that we highly recommend that they take and we might remind them that this is really useful data that we use to drive decision making and um, talk about, you know, what's appropriate to, to help them and services and we do what we can with what we have. Jackie? Jackie? How long does it take, how long would a student have to use how much time to take the survey? It's about, it's about 45 minutes. Um, most, many students are, are done in less time than that, but typically we allow about 45 minutes. Yeah. I know when my advisory took it, they, they finished in less than about 25. Yeah, many of them do. Do we set a time, like Tuesday at 1 yeah. o'clock, yeah. yes. everybody's going to take the survey at Tuesday at 1 o'clock? Yes. yes, we do. Um, and if we have 300 students who are not taking the survey, what are they doing? They are there <laughs> and in the in the room. Right, in the advisory. Just because they don't, they don't get dismissed right. from, from the... Well, in 2017, if they took it during their advisory period. That's the first year. In fact, we had that time, so we used that time. So those students are there, with the exception of, as I mentioned, the, uh, vocational. the vo vocational students are, are, um, are not taking it during advisory time. Mm -hmm. so I, have a, I have a specific question about the, um, the question right after the depression and suicidality. Adults. Um, how many of you got help from an adult when you were feeling better all this? Is that a question that you that all the students answered or just the students who answered yes to one of the previous two questions? That was a separate question on the on the survey. So that's <coughs> all okay. Yes. Overall, um, not per question. No. Yeah, only overall. Like we have the, we know how many students per class, per grade. Right. right. Total, right, and per grade, but unfortunately not per question. Is there, is there a reason why we can't make it mandatory? I, right, like I... I so I think the, na the, the nature of the test, like a, a, a health risk survey is a personal survey, just like even there could be, there are a certain percentage I can't give you, I think it's a minority of students, but there's some parents who says, no, you're not serving my student. Whether the student wants to take it or not, the parent can opt them out. The, right, the child can opt themselves out. Um, I can say I, that um, I've been the one at the high school administering this survey for since 2009 and before, and over those, every year, uh, part of the, the protocol called leading up to giving the survey includes a letter to parents letting them know that the survey will be given and the opportunity for parents to let us know if they do not want their son or daughter, their student, to take the survey. And I can tell you that um, really a handful over eight, nine, ten years of uh, have opted not to, parents have opted not to. Probably, I could probably count on you, yeah, one hand, <laughs> less than five over, the, over those years. But so it's different when students are there in the room and a, 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 the person uh, in 2017, the advisor, um, has instructions that they read and they do have to say as part of that that if you, if you do not want to take the survey, you do not have to. We're not forcing you. We do the best we can to emphasize the importance of it, as Mary mentioned, um, and leading up to it, it, our administrators emphasize the importance with our staff, the advisors or the teachers that will be uh, in the room giving it to students. So all of those things are in place and have been done every two years when the survey is given. So do you have some one? I just wanted to say the one thing I would worry about making them take it is that the quality of the data would go down that if they felt like well I have to do this they might purposely work work on the data and it, what we want is pure data right and I think if you leave it that they if they don't want to take it 
they don't, I think the data itself will be more true. That would be one of my concerns at the high school. Right. And the, in the experience, the vast majority of kids, even when they're like, I don't really know if I want to take it, just a simple, quick conversation, like, that your data is really important, it really matters, remember it's anonymous. I've never had a kid continue to refuse. Okay. Like, they, they usually just, I don't know, it's like that classic bystander effect, you know, like, well, well he's not taking it, so if you're not taking it, then I don't have to take it. And, you know, sometimes that's contagious and sometimes it isn't. But usually if you have a, you know, a strong person and they're saying, you know, it's really important that you take this, we're really valuing this data, they're usually very happy to oblige. Do we give everybody the survey and then some just don't take it? Yes, yes. that is accurate. Have we ever asked them to write down why they do not wish to take it? No. Am I allowed to ask a question? So, uh, are you an employee? No, you're not an employee, right? No, I'm this not. A parent. I'm a parent. And I just had a question in regards to, I know I understand they're taking an advisory, which from what I understand is a smaller group. Perhaps would it have, when you have a smaller group, and let's say there's maximum, I think there's what, eight or ten? Right. Maybe, No, they put it in an envelope. It's never touched again. Um, but and the goal of doing it during advisory too is to not take away from academic time as well. Yeah. Right. No, but that is emphasized. That's a good. It is emphasized. Like your answers are completely not. I'm not looking at them. I'm not. But you, they put them in the envelope themselves. So really, like in college professors would leave the room when you took the survey. We don't leave the room, but it's completely not. You're not even near the where they put the envelope of their data. Great point. So. Um, just um, yeah, I'm thinking of a, a couple of different things here, but we do have staff members available here tonight, and so you know I just want to feel like you you get some questions answered if you want to talk to our our team. You know, who's out there every day with kids because in, in my mind I have a number of things that I want to ask you. One is regarding the professional development on the bottom of the screen up there the suicide intervention, mental health, gender identity. Um, do we re routinely do specific professional development yearly on specific topics yes. that we know happens every year in every school for staff? Well, we have mandatory trainings that we have to do every year. For example, the suicide intervention is, is a mandatory training. Um, the drug awareness, I don't. I think that looks a little different at each phase level. Um, do you guys want to yes. talk about what that looks like at the high school? At the, at the high school level, we have a uh, protocol for, for reporting that, that gets um, rolled out and, and given to staff. And depending on the, the year or what's, what's going on, we might be educating the staff about vaping, for example. Or, or any number of other things that might be going on. So it, there is some variance um, that does happen. So I'm hearing more and more about this issue of jeweling and vaping. Is it the same exact thing? No. Okay, can you explain to us all the difference in the two and what the kids are doing, actually? And I'll be going to you too, Judge. <laughs> Vaping is kind of a general term of using an electronic heating device to inhale some sort of vapor, whether it's nicotine, just a flavored propylene glycol, or sometimes THC. Whereas juuling is, is kind of like a brand, like Kleenex versus tissue, and it's a smaller, very compact device, very similar to the size of a USB port that can charge with any USB port, like in their laptop or in the cell phone or in the wall, and the you know just like the you know, like your laptop charger has that USB plug. So, and that produces very, and they have special pre-filled cartridges, which are usually nicotine, um, that don't produce that. Like a lot of you have seen electronic cigarettes with that massive plume of vapor. 
the jewels don't have that at all. It's very little vapor. And some students have learned to breathe it in and swallow it. Some, when they do it in the bathroom, will blow it into the toilet. So even if you're in the stall next trying to watch uh, for it, you won't necessarily see it. And it's mostly odorless. Uh, you may have a slight faint smell of something like sugary, sickeningly sweet if you're really smelling for it. But again, if you're in a restroom and there's lots of other smells that you won't notice it. Um, real talk. So, um, yeah, it's, there's a variety of products and there's a variety of things that can be inhaled in those products. No, I think that's sufficient. <laughs> but the terms are often sometimes used interchangeably. So what, what I've learned is that those little cartridges contain about an entire pack of cigarettes in nicotine. Well, Juul is 50, what was 50 milligrams? 50 of, milligrams of, of nicotine, nicotine, which some estimates four cigarettes, four cigarettes yeah. So, okay. But it's interesting because, you know, some people can take a day to, to use that cartridge and some kids will try to knock it out within a, you know, half hour, an hour. So it's, you're... If you're inhaling a co more concentrated form of <coughs> nicotine faster, and you're not getting that physical feedback of burning sensation like you would with a cigarette. Mm -hmm. So you're not feeling that singe, um, and so the cycle of smoking can continue faster without any sort of like that traditional coughing or yellowing or odor. Yeah, so there's that popcorn popcorn lung. Lung. No, it's popcorn lung. Side effect of doing that. Oh. The, the, yes. There's a, two chemicals that are often found in any of the vaping products. There's diacetyl and there's propylene glycol. And back, I don't know what year it was, when the like microwave popcorn, popcorn manufacturers, they were using the chemical diacetyl in the manufacturing plants. And then thousands of the employees were getting sick, they're getting lung infections, and they the nickname popcorn lung came from there. It wasn't anything about popcorn, but it was just an infection, like they had chronic lung uh, issues with chronic respiratory issues. Um, so, and those are the chemicals. And, and it's sad because a lot of the students think it's just water vapor, it's just water. It's not, it doesn't work with water. It works with propylene glycol and diacetyl. And there are other chemicals in these products that we do not have long-term research on the effects. Mm -hmm. I mean, these, the two that Mary mentioned, do have, we do know that these are. Uh, do we even know everything that's in it? Because it's not FDA regulated. Right, it's that, and, no, it's, right. That that's in it. and it's interesting, a lot of the students have started to notice because I said, look, look at what it says because it will say this product doesn't contain nicotine. And when they roll it around and look at the fine print, it says this product does contain nicotine. This product contains 5% nicotine or whatever. So they're starting to see that, like, you know, they're manufacturers are allowed to lie and manufacturers goal is money not health so if they can lie and you're doing it and you're enjoying it then they have you hooked for life so it's not about legal is safe or anyone can get it online it's they can because it's a money maker and it's still harm we just it may not be directly lung cancer like you see with cigarettes it may not be you know as direct linked with other issues but it, it's still harmful it seems to be that when we were making progress about kids not smoking cigarettes, right. the companies learned to adjust right. to how can they make their money, and now they are really targeting our younger yeah. kids. Yeah, and to, unfortunately doing to a get very good job. Mm -hmm. to the use of these products. Right. That and is it's working. Correct. Yes, that is accurate. So just turning to our staff, where are, are your all concerns on these issues? I mean, I, I'm not in the school every day, so I don't know how significant this is, but it seems like from what I've, I've heard and read about, this is pretty significant. So, Well, we certainly have concerns about this being used on school grounds. Um, we have found and caught some kids with that and are working with them on a variety of arenas, um, certainly using our support, guidance support services and getting support on that end. Um, we certainly are talking to parents and making them aware of some of these things. And sometimes when we catch them, that's the enlightenment moment. They didn't realize their kids were doing that. Um, so, you know, we certainly don't want them using any of these substances. are not good for them, and it's not appropriate for school. Um, it, it's hard at the home 
odorless or nearly odorless factor makes it more of a challenge. Um, you know, bathrooms, locker rooms can be um, targeted areas of use because you can't have cameras there, nor would we want cameras there, but it does, you know, we have bright children who know how to find loopholes, so that's, that's another concern. Um, I would say this year we have made a concerted effort to do a lot more bathroom coverage. Um, our building ed techs, administrators, great teachers are um, trying to frequent bathrooms and um, flush through and make kids aware that we are on it and notice it. Um, so those are fronts we're working on all the time. And I'm from the middle school. We haven't really had um, to deal with these issues, luckily. Um, they haven't come up. have not come up, but we are, of course, always mm -hmm. looking. We do have more um, information to be presented by the middle school and by um, our Whitworth principal. Um, so I wonder if maybe after the students speak if we transition to that and then there might be some more questions okay like for a final discussion all right tom so um i uh in my experience as a uh, student at the high school especially in the past few years um there have been times where I, uh, where uh, e-cigarettes and jewels have been brought up and i just want to relate some of um some of my experiences. First off, in the times that it has been mentioned, uh, people, uh, students tend to not talk about uh, e-cigarettes, uh, jewels, in the same way as regular cigarettes uh, or smoke, uh, smoking tobacco with many cigars or any of that. They tend to treat it in a very different way um, from my experience. I actually have known some people who do use these devices, um, and this is uh, some of them are like severely addicted to nicotine as a result. And part of part of me just wants to say to them, why, why uh, you know, get addicted to something like nicotine? Why, why let it uh, you know you could take up so much so much of your life? And it really does because. The, the concentrations of nicotine in some of these things are ridiculous. Um, and the other thing, too, is especially jewels are very, uh, they're very small. Um, and they can be disguised in a lot of, you know, backpacks, uh, pencil cases. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, I was in a study hall once and uh, with a few other students, and it, it was a very small study hall. Uh, we all know each other really well, and one of the students asked another uh, regarding a uh, little cartridge of lead for mechanical pencils. Is that a jewel? It's around the same size. Um, so it, it, it can really be hard to tell. Um, and it, it's just difficult uh, to deal with this problem, and I've just got to say to the students who are using them, don't do it. <laughs> Don't do it. Getting addicted to nicotine is not fun, and they're just a slew of chemicals. It, it's not better than smoking. It, just don't do it. <laughs> um, that's what I have to say. Thank you, Thomas. Do you want to add? Uh, yeah, sure. I, I mean, I have never personally seen it, but I, you hear stories in the hallway. Nine times out of ten, someone will have talked about vaping or smoking at some point in the day. <coughs> just walk down the halls. I Like yesterday, I heard someone ask in the calf, do you have a lighter? Like, cigarettes are still a thing, but, um, and marijuana. But I know that a lot of people are doing it in the bathrooms now. It's, and not even just in the bathrooms, but, like, parking lots. It's, like, the student will try to go as far away from the school as possible just so they don't get caught. If you, every once in a while, if you walk down, like, the students are walking to the library after school, You'll every once in a while you'll see someone like right after they get off this the high school's school grounds they might be over on Wentworths but <laughs> they, <laughs> there could be people leaving. Um, so I mean I'm not gonna really reiterate what he said but yeah it's it's a thing it's there. Hmm. Anyone else? I just have a 
quick question yeah. for the high school. Um, more for Mike. Are there like contracts for student athletes? Do they? I remember as a kid, we uh, I think physically signed contracts of a like, code of ethics. Does that they still do. exist? Yeah. They do sign a contract, and we hold them accountable for that. But like you said, it's. Uh, it's challenging, especially after school hours when there aren't supports like there are during the school day. It, um, it's, it's, a, it's a big challenge to monitor all the areas. The high school is a very busy place from 2 o'clock to 11 o'clock at night. And so, um, but and we'll continue to hold kids accountable when we, when we unfold and get them the supports that they need. Can we can we help to cut the knees out of this? Same way as we did with a um, big push against alcohol and tobacco mostly or whatever. Start hitting the children younger, and I'm certainly not saying that for kids too, but um, just to say, you know, this isn't a good idea. Just very casually roll it up. Just, just start to empower them younger. Yeah, so this year we put together a K-12 to Comprehensive Prevention Planning Committee. It's really in its infancy. Molly's a member of that along with myself, our um, police chief, David Courier, Mike Legage. And we are really working, looking at, last year we spent a lot of time working with each phase level to say what are all the things we do in the name of prevention because we really do think it takes it a whole child approach. And it starts in kindergarten with Kelso the Frog and all of the self-regulation that we're teaching our students and then at Wentworth the pathways curriculum and the way they're learning how to talk about their emotions and articulate their feelings and seek help I think that's like that piece of data makes me so hopeful that our students know there's trusted <coughs> adults they can go to for supports all of those skills lead them to a, um, a better a better place when they reach at the adolescent years when we know that their reward center is developing at a rapid pace much faster than their decision-making center um, they're you know unfortunately biologically designed to make risky choices um, so Thomas as much as I would love to just tell him don't do it you know we had that just say no in the 90s and here we are in the midst of an opioid crisis so we know that just say no doesn't work um, but we do believe that a whole child approach where we're looking at all things sleep making sure students are getting adequate sleep stress management making sure students have coping skills and access to resources to manage stress um, looking at technology use this is a huge you know new factor that is affecting our children's brain development at the third most critical point of brain development and so just a little shameless plug for an upcoming event we have um, scheduled on March 29th we're doing an event the k-12 comprehensive planning committee along with the health safety and advisory team that is the town and school combined together. We're planning a big community event um, called Raising Healthy Teens, but it's really Raising Healthy People. So if you have a teen, know a teen, were a teen, walk past a teen, you should come. Um, it's a two-hour event, and so the first hour is going to be a panel discussion where we have four um, local experts coming to talk about um, adolescent brain development and substance use, adolescent brain development and sleep. Um, Molly will be heading up with a colleague from Cape Elizabeth talking about stress management, and we also have an expert coming to talk about technology use so the panelists will do a quick little intro and then um, about their topic of expertise and then there will be questions from the audience the second hour is um, a social health and wellness fair so we have I think about 20 vendors confirmed um, to come and that part will take place the first parts in the auditorium the second part is going to be in our high school calf and we have everyone from prevention yoga studios physical therapists local gyms um, to you know intervention postvention treatment and recovery and so it's going to be a really comprehensive we hope social um, community of event that where we can all come together and just see all of the services that are really wrapped around us um, and hopefully you know if there is someone who is interested in exploring any of the services there they can grab a card or get a demo um, have a conversation and a cookie right Mike um, uh, at the social at the health and wellness fair so 
some promotional information is going to be coming out um, for that event, but we just want to put it out there. It's a family event. You should bring your kids. Don't think if you have a K2, this event, the event is not for you because they're going to be a teen someday. Um, so we really want to have full community support for people who are in the schools and not in the schools as well. So sorry, that just seemed like a good time to bring that up. <laughs> Anything else that anyone Thank wants you so to raise? <coughs> I, I'm, you know, I just have one more quick question. Okay. I see a lot of these caffeine drinks. Yes. They're everywhere right now. You can Still get in quickly at the cash <laughs> register. They're at every store I'm in. This is tea door. I see a lot of empty. <laughs> has caffeine. A lot of empty. <laughs> a lot of empty um, cans around. Is it? Is this also a way kids are kind of getting a high in? Uh, caffeine? It's ridiculous how much some students drink, uh, drink these energy drinks. So, uh, some of them have multiple ones per day, honestly. Uh, and it's not just these energy drinks, it's also some people will have more than... I've even heard some people say they'll have like, four cups of coffee a day um, from Starbucks. So. Really, so like, like what I'm saying is like big cups of coffee. We're defining a cup as this, you know, like what is a but, cup of coffee? Like, like, a, like a big a cup of coffee. More money than I have. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it is a problem. It is a problem. Um, they're, you know, full of caffeine and sugar, and that's what uh, some, some people feel they need. Uh, to make it through the day, that's almost always a reason people give. Um, although, make it through the day. Uh, yeah, although I uh, fortunately do know some students who, uh, especially as time has gone on and um, <coughs> high school, have become more wary of uh, of caffeine and energy drinks and all that, and have you know tried to stay away from that. So that's good. Mm -hmm. I draw the line at neon colored drinks. <laughs> so all of those like flavored. Okay, ruffles. I'm just no I'm noticing the time, okay. and I want to give Di um, Diane time to share her information because I'm sure we'll have some more questions for the middle school. Thank you, Julie. Yes, so I'm um, happy to share with you the results from middle school. Um, I'm going to actually be presenting the pieces for the 7th and 8th grade survey because the way the survey is split up, there is a high school version of the survey, there's a 7th and 8th grade version of the survey, <coughs> and there's a third survey that's for 5th and 6th grade. And so Kelly Crosby will present um, the 5th and 6th grade segment after I um, start with the 7th and 8th grade. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going over the makeup of the survey, although the questions are a little bit different because they're tailored differently to each phase level. Um, the way in which um, the confidence intervals are figured is all very consistent. So if you take a look, you'll see that um, I'm going to be sharing with you data over the past eight years. Um, and you'll see that consistently students at Scarborough Middle School um, have, you know, I know the question came up when you looked at the high school data in terms of the number of students who responded, and we had full participation, and so the results that you'll be looking at really are representative of um, how students in seventh and eighth grade responded. Um, and then I just also wanted to point out the number of students across the state of Maine that take the survey each year in seventh and eighth grade because you'll see that the way in which I presented the data is um, comparing how our Scarborough students are responding versus other seventh and eighth grade students across the state of Maine. So if we take a look at, um, you know, again, what I've done is I've kind of highlighted some of the key areas that I thought you would be very interested in knowing about how our students responded. So um, in terms of safety, I feel safe at my school. Um, if you take a look at this, um, you know, we are in a very high percentage, 92.8% of our students um, say that they feel safe at school, 9 out of every 10 kids. 
um, and as compared to the state, this was statistically significant. And so our students are reporting higher levels of safety versus students in other parts of the state. Um, a question about bullying. Have you ever been bullied on school property? Um, again, how a student might respond to that, that doesn't necessarily mean during this school year, that word ever, um, you know, really uh, allows for a broad interpretation. Um, and again, if you take a look at um, where our students are going with that, those numbers have been dwindling over time. Um, so fewer than four out of every 10 students said that they had had that experience. And again, you can see the significance um, in terms of how much lower that is than the state average. That was great for us to see. Uh, we had a similar question around suicide and depression. <coughs> Have you ever thought uh, seriously about killing yourself? And um, it is very troubling for us to see that about one in ten of our students um, answered positively to that. Again, great to see that is um, decreasing over time and also much less than the state average, but for one in every 10 of our students to be thinking in that direction is of concern. Uh, tobacco use, again, you know, it was great to hear the conversation we were having a few minutes ago from the high school level because, again, I would agree with you, the beliefs that students have and the habits that they start early really determine things. And so this question was um, in the past 30 days, on how many days did you smoke cigarettes? And um, zero students said that they had smoked a cigarette um, at least one out of the past 30 days. So, you know, perhaps that will move along to the high school. We did not have a vaping question on our survey. Um, how easy would it be for you to get cigarettes if you wanted them? Um, you know, between one or two of every ten students think that they could easily get those. You know, so, so that's an important piece for us to know about in terms of how do we share that with parents, um, with the larger community, what does that access look like? Um, again, that number is on the decrease and we are significantly less than the state, um, but it is something for us to be thinking about. Alcohol, um, have you ever had a drink of alcohol more than just a few sips is the way that it's worded. Um, and so 6.6% um, of our students, again, love to see that that's moving in a negative direction. Um, that represents about 30 students in our entire 7th and 8th grade. And I really wanted to put that number in because I think when you say 6% of our 7th and 8th graders, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, that um, kind of helps to put a face to that a little bit more so. Um, ha in the past 30 days, on how many days did you have at least one drink? 1.4% um, of our students said that that was true for them. That represents about six students across our 7th and 8th grade um, in the past 30 days. Again, that number's on the decrease, um, much lesser than the state. I'd like to think that we wouldn't have six students um, drinking alcohol, but again, I think this is a reflection of, you know, where we are. Uh, another question about alcohol, which is one that I really do want to, um, you know, kind of put out in terms of people's attention. Um, how easy would it be for you to get alcohol? And these are the students who said it would be sort of easy or very easy between three or four out of every ten kids. And if you look at the rates, you'll see that consistently over time, Scarborough students are saying more so than other students in the state that it is easier for them to get alcohol in this community. Mm -hmm. And so that's something for us to be thinking about. 
marijuana. Um, have you ever used marijuana was the question. 3.4% uh, of our students, you can see that's much fewer um, than the state average. That equates to about 15 students in our school um, in seventh and eighth grade who have said that they um, have used marijuana. And the um, other marijuana question in the last 30 days, how many times did you use marijuana? 1.8% uh, said that that was true for them at least once in the past 30 days. That equates to about eight students. Um, and if you're wondering eight out of, again, going back to that first slide, uh, 462 students, okay, total. If you wanted to get some, how easy would it be for you to get marijuana? Um, about 32 kids say that it would be sort of easy or easy for them. Um, again, great to see those numbers going down um, over time. Great to see that we are much lesser than the state average. Um, you know, and again, I know that as we were looking at this, we were wondering, you know, what is the change in the state laws around that? Um, how might that come into play here? Um, and then, you know, um, we've got some protective factors that we looked at as well as part of the survey during the last seven days on how many days were you physically active for at least 60 minutes. And these are the students who said they were physically active for 60 minutes or more in five out of seven days. Wish I could say that was true for myself. <laughs> um, about half of our students are saying that that's true for them. So, um, you know, again, we are right in line with what the state average is. Um, another asset question, do you agree that at least one teacher really cares and gives you help and support when you need it? 73% um, of our students, more than uh, seven out of every 10, feel that sense of connectedness with another adult. Um, this was another real strong point um, for us. How often does one of your parents talk with you about what you're doing at school? Um, and these are the kiddos who said um, they felt that that was true for them about every day or at least once or twice a week. Nine out of 10 students. That speaks volumes about our larger community and the conversations that are happening between students and their parents at home. So that's a definite asset for us. Um, and then to just share with you um, some information in terms of what we're doing at Scarborough Middle School to support students around a variety of these issues. Um, this year we did implement our crew, our advisory groups. We have groups of 12 students who are paired with a single staff member. Um, their work is really focused on making sure that we are paying attention to that connection that gets built with adults, um, that we're helping <coughs> students to do more personal reflection and some goal setting and some team building so that there's that greater sense of connectedness. Um, we are also very fortunate to have a very comprehensive PE health and wellness curriculum at every grade level. Um, across all three grades, that work includes decision making, peer pressure, nutrition, and disease prevention. In grades six and seven, there's specific um, units that are built around bullying and tobacco. And in grade eight curriculum, there is work focused around depression, alcohol and marijuana use, and, um, and now vaping um, has been included. We're also very fortunate to have some awesome community partners, um, boys to men, and Hardy Girls Healthy Women have partnered with us to be integrated into our wellness curriculum this year in grade eight. Um, and um, each student as part of their curriculum has had eight different lessons with either one of these groups. And so I think that says um, a lot about uh, 
not just the school's commitment, but the larger community's commitment to this work. Um, in addition, we have a very strong health services department. Um, we have programming that happens through student advocacy, a full-time school resource officer. We have our bridge program, which really helps <coughs> to connect students who are, um, you know, having issues around either, um, you know, physical or mental health spending time away from school and coming back into school. Um, and then we also have a, a specific committee um, designated for um, social and emotional response to intervention so that as we see students struggling, we're coming together as different professionals within the school and planning um, to help students make um, improvements and have more supports. Why don't we have Kelly present, and then we'll have just a larger discussion at the end. I said I'm going to ask Kelly to present, and then we'll have a larger discussion at the end. Oh, thanks for hanging in there with me. Um, most of you. <laughs> I'm Kelly Crosby. I'm the principal at Wentworth School, and I'm the third presenter um, to share data, and it's going on 9 o'clock, so I'm going to be very engaging. And this is the fifth and sixth grade data. This is the first year, um, 2017 was the first year that our fifth graders um, participated in the Maine Integrated Youth Health Survey. Um, so the data, as Diane mentioned, is that though this doesn't follow our grouping structure, we decided to report out this way because the question questions are similar for the fifth and sixth graders and a little a slightly different focus for them um, and it's also been a great opportunity for Diane and I to collaborate across <laughs> these levels and talk about what some of the um, similar challenges are <coughs> and similar strengths because there are many so we had 423 fifth and sixth grade students surveyed last year in 2017 that was pretty evenly split so there were 214 fifth graders and 207 sixth graders <coughs> and there are two that didn't identify which grade they were in, so that's how that adds up. Um, so <laughs> they are little, <laughs> they are little and trying to figure this out. Um, and that was very f near 100% um, participation for our students. So we don't have any trend data yet. I'm just speaking to 2017 because it was the first year. So we'll just be kind of looking at how do our respondents compare to the state level. So a lot of the questions were really around health and safety. The first section was around unintentional injury. So questions like how often do you wear your seatbelt when you're riding in the car? And 85.2% of our students reported that they always wear their seatbelt. And you can see how that compares to the um, state level. And the next question is, are, uh, again, around unintentional injury, around wearing your helmet when you ride your bike. Um, so I know that this looks scary at first, but it's like the opposite data, right? It's the opposite. I was just trying to keep you on your toes. I'm the third presenter. So it's the percent of students who answered never or rarely, OK? So <laughs> more than 90% of our students do consistently wear their helmet. This is good news data. It was just reported slightly differently. <laughs> We had um, some great response with the question that I feel safe at my school. 96.1% um, of our students reported that they do feel safe at our school with either strongly agree or agree. So that's with our fifth graders and sixth graders. And then the next question is around bullying. And again, the same, um, and it's worded the same way as Diane mentioned. Have you ever been bullied on school property? So it's open for some interpretation, but fewer than four out of 10 of our students are reporting that. And, um, you know, I, I want that number to certainly be zero, but that's um, a low statistic to begin with as compared to the state. So I think that that's a great starting point to look really closely at for moving forward. And same as the middle school data, our fifth and sixth graders, zero students reported ever trying a cigarette, even one or two puffs. So 
Um, and to your question earlier <coughs> was around, um, I know it's actually kind of sad that they, you know, were, were responding to this question, but I see their D.A.R.E. classes, and D.A.R.E. takes place in fifth grade, and they're like, oh, God, no, gosh, <laughs> terrible, never. Right. And so the next question is, do you think that you will smoke a cigarette at any time during the next year? And 98.3% of our students said, absolutely, I will definitely not. <laughs> so that I know, so this is really great news. There were no Freeze. questions about vaping or jewels or anything like that in the fifth and sixth grade. Kelly, does the D.A.R.E. curriculum talk about vaping or only? It did incorporate that this year. Yeah, that was the first time. So the next couple of questions are about alcohol. And again, some great news that none of our fifth or sixth graders had reported um, having at least a drink of alcohol over the past 30 days. So that's excellent news and what I would expect. But following a similar trend, um, the question, if you wanted to get some alcohol, how easy would it be for you to get some? And 13.6% of our students said that it would be either sort of easy or very easy for them to do so at fifth and sixth grade. During the past 12 months, have you talked with at least one of your parents about the dangers of tobacco, alcohol, or drug use? And um, a bit more than half of our students have talked about that with their parents over the past 12 months. Again, I know I keep referencing <coughs> there that, that it's such a big piece of fifth grade, and that's a huge emphasis for them to have those conversations, and it's actually part of their homework to talk with their parents about, their, uh, about substances. And the parents are always really excited because kids begin looking at, you know, an evening glass of wine really differently <laughs> in kind of a judgy way, so, um, which is exactly what we want for them to happen. So the next section is around nutrition. Um, the question is about fruits and vegetables, um, and the question is worded, about yesterday. It's not having them think about it over the course of a week. So yesterday, did you have five or more servings of fruits and vegetables? And it gives, you know, a, a definition of that. And a little more than half of our students reported that they had five or more servings of fruits and vegetables the day before this survey was given. <laughs> The next question is to your point earlier, who I think Donna, you asked about the energy drinks. Mm -hmm. So um, the question is about a can, bottle, or glass of soda, sports drinks, energy drinks, like sugary sweetened drinks that are the no-no in the 5210. Um, and 53.3% of our students, oh, sorry, that graph is a little weird. More than half of our students answered yes, that at least one time on the previous day, they had one of these drinks. I think it's just the scale. It's the scale. scale. It's just weird, but the, yeah. um, the numbers are accurate. What is SU? Yeah, what is that? Sugary drink. I mean, just a little typo in there. <laughs> like, another thing I don't know about. <laughs> this is this new really cool trend that the kids are doing. I think it's sugary drink. And in the past seven days, um, I think this is really great news for our extremely busy families. I was actually pretty surprised to see this number um, because I know how busy our students and families and community is. But during the past seven days, on how many days did you eat dinner at home with at least one of your parents? Um, and that's um, nearly 90% of our students said at least five out of the past seven days. So I think that's really great. Physical activity. How many days each week do you exercise, dance, or play sports for at least an hour? And I double checked this statistic because um, this is reporting the percent of students who answered at least seven days. So I'm not sure how you can do more <laughs> days in a week, but that is how it was worded, so maybe it tricked some of the kids too. Um, but 22.3% of our students said that they exercise at least seven days. <laughs> I love that so the next one is around screen time. And almost half of our students reported that their total daily screen time is two hours or less, excluding schoolwork. 
Um, and wow. two hours or less was the lowest category that they could choose on, on the survey. So um, that... Right, two or fewer hours. Correct. And then the next question is still about physical activity. During an average week, how many days do you spend in after school clubs or programs or organized activities other than sports outside of regular school hours? And so more than um, half of our students are engaged in another club or activity. So I think that that's really great. And I, I know that there are a lot of offerings at the school level. And I know that, the, that students are involved in dance and all sorts of other community-based activities as well. There are a couple of questions on the survey about sun protection and um, six out of ten of our students answered that they when they're outside that they're using SPF 15 or higher to protect their skin and then the section around assets like at the other two phases do you agree or disagree that you have parents who try to help you succeed and that was an overwhelming strongly agree or agree 95.2 percent of students reported that they strongly agree or agree that their parents try to help them succeed. And then nearly 9 out of 10 students agreed that they had at least one teacher who really cares and gives help or support when they need it. So similar to what Diane just reported, um, some of the ways that we support our students around these issues in both fifth and sixth grade, it's really about a connection to adults and having the opportunity to reflect and set goals and build team and just be a part of it all and know that they're cared about and a valuable member of our community. In fifth grade, we do that through homeroom and consistent contact for classroom circles and the work that they do in a more classroom-based situation. And in sixth grade, as Diane mentioned, um, they have the crew and advisory groups as one of the vehicles for this goal. Um, also, I've mentioned it a few times throughout, but there's comprehensive PE health and wellness curriculum at both phases for fifth and sixth grade. DARE is in fifth grade, puberty education, really focusing on taking care of your body and the changes that your body um, undergoes in, through that phase in your life happens in fifth grade also. And then weekly PE, they still have recess. There's a lot of time for physical activity in fifth grade and in sixth grade um, Diane mentioned these things earlier but I want to capture them here as well and include the health services and school resource officers and the bridge program at the middle school but I think that the programming through student advocacy is really important for both phases the small group and one-on-one -on -one services but also Julie mentioned this earlier that pathways is a once a week full trimester every year of developmental guidance lessons for all students and it's really focused on um, self-esteem and self and empathy and all of these great things that um, support students in their health and development. I think that that's it. Yes. So I'm going to join them back at the table and you can ask us any questions. Jackie? I have a question that I don't think you have an answer for but I'm going to ask that perhaps it be considered the next time you have to do the survey. How much of the marijuana might be, that is available, could be medical ma marijuana? I know that more and more people, I have a sister who takes it to help her sleep, for example, and more and more people have take marijuana to alleviate whatever. So it is possible uh, that our students have access to marijuana because it is a medical prescription in the family. I'm not sure that there's a question about um, access to marijuana. There's a question about access to tobacco and alcohol, but they do report on if they've used marijuana. And so I wonder if the survey mm -hmm. is considering changing that, you know, to for non-medical purposes. Right. Just like the prescription drugs question, they it's stated in a way that's in the past whatever many days, have you used a prescription drug that was not prescribed to you? So yeah. maybe some nuanced language there. But that's a great point, Jackie. Anyone else? Yeah, I was wondering why don't they include the um, adverse childhood experiences for the middle school? Do you know? No. So we have an opportunity to, um, we can elect to give that separately. 
I think, again, it's just they're constantly trying to evolve. Like, the surveys are constantly evolving based on trends and what's happening in terms of behavior. But um, we did just get um, an invitation from Opportunity Alliance to explore some other um, types of information gathering processes. I actually have a question about the bullying. It was in, you know, fifth to eighth, but it was not included in the high school. Was it a question not asked, or was it just not reported? The question was asked. We just didn't include it in our report. Okay. Is it? Yeah. There's many that? questions asked that aren't. Okay. Yeah. We tried to pull out the ones that we thought that kind of arched across the grades, or that we had trend data on over time at the high school level specifically. But the, we have the full report that has every question. Anyone else? Um, yeah, I was wondering if you had any ideas on, I know that part of the, um, part of the reason that CREW was implemented was to provide students with a teacher mm -hmm. who maybe was that, you know, like a person that they felt that like they could go to throughout their time right. at the mm -hmm. school. And yet the year that we did it, the numbers seemed to have gone down of, where was this it? Was so this was given before it we was before crew. Yeah. Okay. We just I just think that would be really interesting year. to see. Yeah. Like yep. when when it's given to the kids who have had crew for two years, like if that right. jumps out. I know. agree with you. But the crew, they don't get to stay with their crew teacher, though, correct? Don't they get a different crew teacher each year, or is that changing? I didn't know if that. The so initial plan that. was that they would that that would be a year experience, and then they would move. Um, but again. We're, you know, finishing that first year, and so we're going to be, you know, looking back and thinking forward mm -hmm. about, you know, what people think in terms of, you know, that best next step. So it's possible they might. Yeah, I think that that's something that we're still kind of so. under advisement with our staff. That's interesting. Is that, sorry, just to clarify, that is how it works at the high school, though. They have the same advisory teacher yes. from... Yeah. Right. The middle school has a few different challenges because, as you know, our sixth grade learning community is in a separate building. Mm -hmm. And so currently um, our students, um, many of our students' crew placements are based on the grade level that they're in. And so there is a physical and time challenge if we were to maintain crews because then we would have to have, you know, 220 students um, actually, 440 students crossing over um, from one building to the next for that. So I think right. you know that is a factor, a structural factor yeah. that gets in the way of some of our decision making at the middle school. Right. Yeah, I have an answer to your question. Thank you. At the high school in 2017, 19.2 percent answered yes during the past 12 months. Have you been bullied on school? Thank you. What was it the year before, do you know? It was 23.3. And does it? But there's no significant difference. And it's college. during the past 12 months or not, not 12 ever? Months. Okay. So, so the word is different. The different. Yeah. So yours is ever, right? Yeah. yeah. Does it quantify? Does it kind of like give examples of bullying or just says bullying? No. Just bullying. Mm -hmm. And just up to your own discussion. The percentage for Scarborough High School were not statistics. Uh, Change, no change, right? And also not different from the state. Oh. So I'm just going to ask our student representatives to chime in on your reaction to that figure. It seems way too low. Way too low. We both agree. Way too low. Way too what do low. you see? What would you guess? I well over fifty, I think. It's well just because it, it depends on the context you're taking bullying out of. Yeah. I'm thinking because when I was looking at the like statistics from other schools in bullying, it I think that depending on what the student's thinking bullying is, because when you see like bullying on TV or like social media, it's like an actual attack. So mm. I think it definitely depends on what like context they're taking bullying out of, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because like bullying could be as little as like saying one thing to someone. Mm -hmm. Or it could be like what one student would consider like a death threat. Right. So I think that that's just a really low number. If you were to like give a student every possible example, it would have been a lot higher. Well, it's interesting that the question asks on school property. And I think if you think about what happens on school property versus what happens on Instagram or Snapchat, mm -hmm. then that completely changes everything. Mm -hmm. So I, I wonder why that question is oh. asked. Is there a cyberbullying question on there? 
That could be one <laughs> we need. <laughs> yeah. So what are the, some of the things that you think our high school kids are facing that are not on that survey that well, really should be things we're worried, we should be worried about? Cyberbullying would be a big one. Uh, I, probably the biggest one, I'd argue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The biggest one is cyberbullying. Yep. He said cyberbullying. Cyberbullying. cyberbullying would be the think, biggest one. Yeah, cyberbullying seems to be a huge problem. And a lot of it could be like really indirect. Um, I think other problems could be like I like those kind of the ACES questions because if there were a couple more types like that, yeah. I think that would give a better idea of what's going on because like yeah. specifically like what's going on ho at home really like has an impact on the student. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and well, think, and I think the bullying question could almost be set up that way, mm -hmm. like to give seven, ex you know, cyberbullying, this kind of, you know, these, and then check, you know, count up how many you've experienced, and that's your number. Mm -hmm. What, what else? Like you said, there's a lot of different. Well, uh, I don't know all of the questions that were on. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Any, all the questions that were on the uh, test, so I can't say with certainty exactly what wasn't no, asked. But I'm, like, I am kind of getting at what would be the next major issue that you oh, think oh, I see. you see at the high school rather than oh. what was on that questionnaire. Hmm. That's a tough one. I think that one question that I know has impacted some students like kind of way of life is like discipline when it comes to grades and stuff. Things the way that like parents are, if there were questions kind of talking about how greeting is, because I know there I have plenty of friends who, if they get anything below an 85, or in my sister would be like a level uh, three in the middle school, <coughs> there are punishments, and but like whether it be like get your phone taken away for a week, or it's I don't know, like just no TV that night, or some sort of thing that would kind of affect the student. Some more things so, going yeah. on at home. So, yeah. To, to chime in about on that. To, yeah. to, yeah. to chime in on that. Um, I'd have to say, I don't know if it's because of the people I hang out with, but uh, one of the most frequently talked about things are grades, uh, no matter the context at school, pretty much. So, um, anything relating to grades is quite, as expected, quite at the center of students' attention. So. So pressure around yeah. performing. Grade, grades are oh, graded definitely. like awards. Grades are awards at the schools. Yeah. It, it's grades kinda, are what, Dylan? Grades are treated like awards at the schools. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of interesting how people. I mean, you mean among the grades. students? Is that, is that what the you're saying? Students. Grades yeah. are treated the like rewards? Look, there's a lot of. Um, awards. No, oh, awards. 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 Grades are treated like yeah. getting an award if you yeah. get that grade. Yeah. If you don't get a good grade on something, though. Then yeah, and then, like, yeah, you basically. <laughs> you don't get that because I don't know it's just something that like a student's entire like school like in our curriculum or kind of their whole entire like student life is based around grades yeah. from a lot of kids at Scarborough some people can make a like real big melodrama out of it honestly yeah um, and uh, like with the culture around it in some cases I don't blame them because uh, uh, it really does feel like for a lot of students getting a anything in the 80s, uh, depending on you know what level they are, mm -hmm. anything in the 80s is just unacceptable. It would have to be in the 90s. Some people uh, won't accept anything below 95, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and I mean, you know, it, it's putting a lot on themselves. It's also putting a lot on the people that don't get those grades. Mm -hmm. Because those, those people that tend to have those standards also tend to be very vocal. Uh, so. Mm -hmm. so, so are you saying that students who are higher achievers are throwing it in the faces of those students who are not achieving at that level? Well, I mean, it, it seems natural that if someone gets a good grade, they're, they're going to bring it up. Um, oh yeah. Um, and if and some people consistently get high grades. Right. And <coughs> you know, some of these students have the standard as a result that anything below a certain 
grade is not good. Um, so, but how do they approach that? With it really depends on the student. Some, you know, are, you know, keep their grades to themselves. Typically, I, I like to do that. I don't usually talk about my grades too much. Um, some students are very, you know, talk a lot about their grades mm -hmm. and very loudly too. Yeah, the tests handed out, like once oh, your test yeah. is graded, like the first thing you oh, hear God. everyone say is, what'd you get? It, exactly. <laughs> so I think that connects into um, performance <laughs> expectations and stress management, mm -hmm. right? That's how I'm, I'm thinking about that. And um, in, interestingly about stress management, the, the thing that there, there will always be one student before every test that says, I'm going to fail. <laughs> Um, usually the student that says that fortunately doesn't fail um, but it, it's still that mentality that yeah. it's crazy there's kind of a culture going on there uh, among our students that really is not supportive in any way of each other it's more I'm gonna put you guys down because I'm gonna be way up here it, we got that right uh, I heard it differently. I heard yeah. it being more that even if you're just listening to students talk about their performance, yeah. it might not be targeted at you, but it just creates all that. All you need. I, I if you know you're not able to perform in that same way, that's I, how I was hearing yeah. it. Yeah, I, I rarely, I don't know about you, but I don't think that it's usually targeted. It's just no. that yeah. people are very vocal about their grades. They, they are. <laughs> Um, and that can have certain effects. And so I think there's a way, and, I, and this is obviously a, a building conversation, but there's a way for, for kids to be proud of the grades that they get, mm. but it needs to be in a more positive light in that not saying if you get in the 80s, God, I would not have survived in Scarborough High School is, <laughs> yeah. but if you get in the 80s, then that's bad or unacceptable. Like that's the part that's negative. People can feel proud and and be vocal about their grades if they want to, but it, the part that sort of makes me feel not so great is that there are kids who aren't obviously getting in the 90s or 95 and above. That seems crazy, mm -hmm. and they're feeling inadequate or or. Mm -hmm not as smart or whatever it is that they're feeling so there needs to be a way to allow those students to feel proud but not put well, down the others I mean yeah I would agree I would agree with that that a lot of people do feel inadequate about it I think that it's just the way that people think about grades it is very skewed from what it should be mm -hmm. um, I do have to say though I have not heard from anyone because I don't tend to talk to like freshmen or middle school students but yeah. I think the proficiency base based where you get like a three or four instead of like an 85 or a 92 mm -hmm. it you would see less of it and I think I I wouldn't mind looking into that because I think that that problem might go down but <laughs> It, it's really I, well, I, you're, specific numbers. Uh, unknowingly, that actually is part of the trans. Yeah. The transition yeah. is to take the emphasis off of grades and make it more about the learning, mm -hmm. um, so that we're talking more about what you know and what you're ready to learn, as opposed to like what that number is. Mm -hmm. um, so that is part of the fundamental shift, um, but it takes time to really get a deep understanding, and we're still doing that work as a district. Yeah. And we will be for quite some time. And I think we as parents add to that pressure. I'll speak for myself. But I think we add to that pressure because that's what we grew up with. Right. In that we grew up with getting, you got a number. And here, here's where it falls in that scale. And so it's a huge shift not only for the students and how they're graded, but the parents and how we see those numbers and what does that mean like now when we see three or four we have to change our thinking to know what that means mm -hmm. yeah well, there's such a thing as expectations being reasonable and I can tell you right now my parents cheered when I got a 70 in French <laughs> <laughs> so I hope that Thank um, you.
I don't want to end our conversation, but I am noticing the time and want to be respectful of everyone's time. Our administrators have been working since very early this morning, and as have our students and our teachers. Um, so our intent tonight was just to bring our eye towards some data. Um, we really are working hard in Scarborough to, you know, back up our smart thinking and our assumptions with evidence and this is something we ask our students every two years to tell us these things and I feel that as the adults in the community we have um, we owe them the time to unpack this data and make sense of it and wonder about some of the things that we're seeing here um, and although we do use data to help drive and inform our decision making we want to be really careful that we're not using any one data point in isolation um, as you can see when students are self reporting or when any of us actually are self-reporting, there's always the question of, well, I wonder how that question was interpreted. Um, it helps when you have a, an, a, um, a survey like this that's been normed and that's been um, given to large scales of, of students because um, we have some really smart people helping us make sure that questions aren't biased um, and they're not um, leading students down a, a path in, uh, intentionally or unintentionally um, just to get some sort of certain reason result. So um, we are going to continue to be looking at data. This is something that we'll continue to monitor over the next few years. Um, I think it's important for us when we're thinking about the whole child and how we educate the whole child that we think about all of these different layers and the roles that each of us plays in creating a really healthy safe learning environment. So I think our administrators, you totally exceeded my expectations, um, Molly and Mary and uh, Diane and Kelly in the way that you presented the data and really walked us through it. You took a big complex report and made it um, meaningful for me and I see people nodding so I think for the school board as well so I just wanted to thank you for that um, and then turn it back over to you. Absolutely, thank you for all all of you for being present and doing these presentations tonight. And I know it's Absolutely. really late, so I applaud you. For <laughs> have a great vacation. So oh, yes. nine point oh. Is there a motion to adjourn the meeting? Second. Very good. All in favor? Mm -hmm. Seven plus two. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Have a good vacation. Nine forty. Good morning.